CAR T cell therapy has worked pretty well in the young adult, the pediatric population, for ALL. Well, we're going to look at it here in a slightly different setting. Really a tough group. Relapsed refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And this is Juliet. It's the first global study of a CAR T cell therapy for adults. And I'm with Dr. Stephen J. Schuster, who is the lead investigator of Juliet and uh, director of the lymphoma program and the director of the lymphoma translational research at Penn Medicine and, of course, a professor at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. This is exciting on a number of different levels. Let's start with some background on Juliet and what you're trying to do with this trial. So our therapies um, uh, are fairly successful in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So about two-thirds of patients will either respond to primary therapy, or if they don't, we can give a second line or salvage therapy and take them to a transplant procedure. And about two -thir roughly two-thirds of patients are satisfactorily treated. The remainder of those patients are, are problematic. Those patients in general that either don't respond to second line therapy, um, that is they're refractory to immunochemotherapy, or who've already had a transplant and have an early progression after the, of a relapse of their disease after the transplant, uh, those patients have no good existing therapy. In fact, response rates even palliatively are low under 20% to existing agents, and median survival is in months, about three or four months. So it's a group of patients that um, it, it has been frustrating because we feel we can actually save lives in diffuse large B cell lymphoma, but not these patients. Right. You know, that, that's been the problem. So having watched the early success in the pediatric ALL, because a lot of that was done at Children's Hospital and uh, right next door to us at Penn, and CLL, was starting to be studied as well, which is part of my department. Um, uh, the idea came, no brainer. You know, if it works for this, it might work for that. Right. You know, and so we started a study in 2013. Um, the results of which are published today in the New England Journal. So we actually have long-term follow-up on these patients and uh, uh, with exciting results. And the Juliet trial uh, uh, was sponsored by Novartis, who actually licensed from Penn the T-cell technology, the vector, um, to make a product called T-cell glucil or Kimraya, you know, uh, took a lot of practice. Yeah, uh, very they, good. They, but, um, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, Novartis being, you know, a, a very, very good company and a global company was able to sponsor a trial. Uh, they looked at our data and said, you know, this looks spectacular in large B cell lymphoma. Let's, let's modify your trial a bit and make it global. And we did. I worked with them. And, and then we basically did what I was very similar to what I was doing at Penn um, in tw at 27 centers in 10 countries on four continents. And we were able to successfully export the technology. The patients did the same. They didn't have to come to Philadelphia to the University of Penn. Uh, they could be treated in Australia, in Japan, in Germany. And we were able to go around and, and, and uh, train the site personnel so that unique toxicities could be managed. And the efficacy looked like very much like uh, um, uh, the efficacy we saw in our early trials. Well, the efficacy we saw on our early trials is sustained. So a single infusion of these cells at a median follow-up of 29 months, none of the patients had relapsed. Jeez. Okay, it's amazing. Yeah. You know, and and they just get you know the, those patients that have been sick after the two weeks of early symptoms related to T cells get better and better and better. It's really gratifying to watch. But anyway, so extrapolating from my paper and looking at the Juliet data, where the overall response rate was like 37 or 38 percent at three months, and still 37 or 38 at six months, the same plateau. That's what I saw. I can anticipate that those patients will have a duration of response. It's going to be years. So this is a game changer. So if they get to about three months, that's the key. That's the key. Ninety-five percent of patients, if they're in CR at three months, will stay in CR for years. So you actually met the the primary objective was met at the interim. Or the oh yeah, the primary <laughs> the primary objective was met instantly because the because it's such a low bar. We have nothing that works, you know, uh, with any kind of high percentage rate and with no any duration in uh, in this group of patients. These are this was a major unmet need in the lymphoma world. And by the way, diffuse large B cell lymphoma is not uncommon. It's the most common lymphoma, and uh, there are lots of these patients. So this is really going to serve, this new therapy will serve a lot of people. How long do you have uh, patients out for now? 
Uh, my longest patients are approaching fourth, uh, actually in January will be four years in complete remission. Yeah, and I know of one patient that was treated at the NCI, which was doing a different car, who's seven years in complete remission. So it's entirely possible that many of these patients will have long-term disease-free survival and, uh, uh, and not deal with their lymphoma again. Again, after a single treatment, right. not taking pills every day and, you know. So centralized manufacturing yep, was feasible. With, with global distribution and training personnel to deal with cytokine release syndrome and the, and the unique toxicities is possible. So you use cryopreservation, I yep. take it? Yep, so they do a leukophoresis. We cryopreserve the leukophoresis product, and then it's shipped. There's two centers now that are making it. One is in Mars Plains, New Jersey, uh, U.S., and in uh, Germany, in uh, Leipzig, I think. Yeah. So what's next? Um, well, oh, well, well, so well okay, next? okay. So, so I think we're roughly, you know, 30 to 40, maybe a third of patients are going to be long-term successes. So what we have already been studying and are moving ahead on uh, is to look at the ones that are failing. And most of them are not failing because the T cells are no good. The products test normally in vitro, the cells grow, they express the chimeric receptor. We look at what's happening in vivo. They're expanding you know, logarithmically, but the disease progresses. So what we've been able to do at Penn is biopsy our patients and study the characteristics of what's going on in the tumors in these patients, and uh, and in Juliet now we're beginning to probe the same thing because, you know, we treated 28 patients that we published. I'm up to about 50 now, but 28 that were that we published all the long-term details on, and in Juliet, uh, we have complete. We, we enrolled 127 patients, you know, so, uh, and we have material on all these patients. So a lot of the observations we're making in our smaller group of patients, we're gonna we're gonna mine the data in Juliet. So so one of the things we've seen is that. Loss of CD19, which is the commonest reason for failure in ALL, which is a different disease, obviously, um, is maybe 10 to 20 percent of the time the reason in large B cell lymphoma. The majority of cases, it's because the tumor cells upregulate inhibitory ligands. So we realized this during our trial, and we started a trial rescuing patients that were progressing during T cell expansion with a checkpoint inhibitor, pembrolizumab. So a little a small portion of those results will be presented tomorrow afternoon in a poster form, but we're almost actually completed that study. We just haven't done all the laboratory correlates yet. We're working on some of the procedures. So I'm saying we may get a third of patients with the CAR cells. We may be able to rescue another third with a checkpoint inhibition. That brings us to about you know 60%. And then there's, there's a few other peculiarities, like there's occasionally patients, the cells just don't expand in vitro. Like, they're healthy cells, they expand in vitro, you put them in the body, and the, so it looks like one or two of those patients that Carl June has studied, they actually were making, and David Maloney has also made this observation, they make a, uh, in Seattle, who also is doing car work, um, um, another auto mechanic, um, so uh, um, that, that they can make an immune response against the murine component of the of the CD19 receptor. So some of these patients are probably knocking out these car cells because they're seeing them seeing them as foreign. Oh, okay. So what we've done at, at Penn and, and others are doing, we've made a human uh, anti-CD19 car and to, to test. And so maybe those patients will respond to a human a car. That's an uncommon reason for failure, but it exists.